Welcome to Clinical Minute. Highly Effective Reversible Methods Contraceptive Implant Insertion, Management, and Follow-up Alexis is a 20-year-old woman, Gravita Zero, who is bisexual, currently dating a male graduate student, and has been using condoms for contraception. In a previous visit, you counseled Alexis on her contraceptive options. Given her stated desire for long-acting reversible contraception, or LARC, you counseled Alexis on a number of topics regarding IUDs and contraceptive implants, including those listed on the slide. She chose the contraceptive implant and presents today for insertion. The only contraceptive implant available in the U.S. is Nexplanon. It is a single off-white radiopaque rod that is 4 centimeters in length and 2 millimeters in diameter and is preloaded in the needle of a disposable applicator. The difference between Nexplanon and the previous generation of the implant, Implanon, is that the current implant has a new inserter and contains barium to allow localization with X-ray or CT scan. The implant is for subdermal use only and is placed in the upper arm. It contains 68 milligrams of the synthetic progestin etinogestrel, which continuously releases etinogestrel over the three years after insertion. Once inserted, the release rate is 60 to 70 micrograms per day in weeks 5 to 6, decreasing to approximately 35 to 45 micrograms per day at the end of the first year, 30 to 40 micrograms per day at the end of the second year, and 25 to 30 micrograms per day at the end of the third year. Specific training in implant insertion and removal is required by the manufacturer. Insertion is performed as an outpatient procedure. The implant should be placed subdermally, just below the skin, at the inner side of the non-dominant arm about three to four inches above the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The clinician must take care to avoid vessels and nerves in the subcutaneous layers. On average, insertion takes about half a minute. Implant removal takes about three and a half minutes. If the clinician has a reasonable assurance that the woman is not pregnant, lab tests and exams are not needed and the implant can be inserted at any time of the cycle. A backup contraceptive method should be used for four days. However, backup contraception is not needed if insertion takes place during the first five days of menses. Satisfaction with the implant is highly dependent on acceptance of the method's limitations, especially with respect to bleeding irregularities. To maximize the chance that this option will work well for Alexis, you proactively counsel her about possible menstrual changes, including infrequent bleeding, amenorrhea, and prolonged bleeding. You let Alexis know that amenorrhea does not signal pregnancy. You discuss the options for managing menstrual changes if they occur and are bothersome. These options include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for five to seven days, low-dose combined oral contraceptives, or short-term estrogen. You let her know that in many women with implants, these menstrual changes improve over time. You let Alexis know that serum levels of etinogestrel drop quickly after implant removal, and fertility will return rapidly. You remind her that she will need an alternate contraceptive if pregnancy is not desired when she discontinues the implant. You remind Alexis of the most common side effects other than menstrual changes that may occur with the contraceptive implant and the possible risks. With the implant, side effects related to hormones may occur, such as headaches, nausea, depression, and breast tenderness. You let Alexis know that possible risks of use of the implant include problems related to the insertion or removal. These occur in less than 2% of women. You also let her know that in the rare case that a woman becomes pregnant with the implant in place, she is at slightly higher risk for an ectopic pregnancy. 
you remind Alexis to report any adverse effects to a healthcare provider and to tell all healthcare providers, especially prescribers, about the implant to help avoid drug interactions. You counsel her to report any instances of abdominal pain, which might be a sign of ectopic pregnancy or ovarian cysts. Alexis returns with a friend the next day. The insertion goes smoothly. You let Alexis know that she will be able to feel the implant under her skin. You remind her to plan on removal no later than three years from the insertion date. Finally, you remind Alexis that the implant does not protect against STIs and to use condoms with new sexual partners. About four weeks later, you receive a phone call from Alexis. She states that she is having prolonged bleeding. Her menstrual flow usually lasts for three days, but she has been bleeding for six so far. Upon questioning, you learn she feels well otherwise and that the flow is not heavier than normal. She has been changing the tampon about every three hours. You note that her LMP started approximately three weeks ago. What advice do you give Alexis? You recall the management options for menstrual changes associated with the implant. You recommend that she takes an NSAID with food three times a day for five days and call you back if the bleeding continues for more than 10 days total. You tell her to contact you or another care provider if she develops fever, abdominal pain, or a substantial increase in flow. You ask Alexis if she has any concerns or questions. She says no. You recommend that she schedule an annual well woman visit and contact you if she has any concerns in the interim. She agrees. Before saying goodbye, she adds, It is a huge relief not to worry about getting pregnant. A little longer period is a small price to pay for freedom from worry.